Kalijah Kansi is looking to have a big second season with the Buccaneers. That and more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome into this Tuesday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listen review every single day. Don't forget you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can follow along on Twitter. I am James Yarko at JYarko underscore Bucks, credentialed member of the media covering your Tampa Bay Buccaneers as deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com. Come here with you every Monday through Friday, along with the everydayers. And for that, I want to share my appreciation for your continued support of the show. One of the ways you can support the show is become a Locked On Bucks insider. You're going to get news, rumors, updates, general thoughts, plus one-on-one conversations with me via text message. Go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Bucks to become an insider today. I am sure my uh, Locked On Bucks insiders and I are going to have a lot of fun texting back and forth as the NFL draft on you know, un rolls or, or, uh, you know, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but as it begins to play out, we're going to have a lot of fun chatting about who is picked, who, uh, surprises, things like that. So go to join subtext.com slash locked on bucks. This episode is brought to you by game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. The Buccaneers bring back a familiar face, and Zion McCollum is demanding more of himself. That's all coming up in a little bit, but we are going to start with the Buccaneers beginning their voluntary offseason program, where a lot of the top players were there, including new fathers Baker Mayfield and Tristan Wirfs. A very sincere congratulations to the both of them and uh, the lovely mothers of their children. Very cool very exciting for those first time dads, but we are going to talk about Kalijah Cansey. Cansey is looking to improve on a relatively impressive rookie campaign where even though he only played in 14 games and took just 62% of defensive snaps, he finished with four sacks, 10 tackles for loss, 12 quarterback hits and 26 total tackles. Now heading into year two, not only is he expecting big things of himself, but the Buccaneers are obviously expecting more big plays and a, an even bigger impact out of him. Alongside Vita Vea, Cansey became a viable threat to opposing offenses and their offensive lines and created a lot of opportunities for the other players on the Bucs defense. Cansey spoke to the media on Monday and was asked about what he learned in his rookie year and his goals for taking the next step. Cansey said, quote, I definitely learned a lot about myself. It was a little uncertain starting off as far as being set back with the calf injury and starting the season off a little late. My main thing was getting back to myself and how I was in college. I wanted the NFL to be as easy as college. It came with patience. I had to learn a different scheme going against veteran guys who've been in the league for a lot of years. I just had to get the repetition. And when I got the repetitions, it all started to pick up. That's where I want to be. I want to work off of where I finished and be better. Then he went on to say, my biggest goal this offseason, honestly, is just to go back and look at everything where I could have been better. Something like a play where I could have made the play and didn't. I'm really just oiling up everything as far as my moves, my get off, my play recognition, everything running to the ball. I'm just kind of working off of what I've already done and being better at it. End quote. I have talked on this show about how the Bucs may still look to upgrade their defensive line next week during the NFL draft. And if a player like Jerzon Newton is sitting there for them at 26, they may want to jump all over it, relegating Logan Hall to a rotational position. But all of that speculation on my part is built off of, first, the lack of pass rush last season, but second, the abilities of Vea and Cansey in finding a guy that can be as, as effective as those two are off the snap. I've mentioned in the past with Vea and Cansey, you have a pretty impressive 
defensive front, but edge rushers weren't giving them any help. Beefing up that edge rush, finding an impact guy to go on the other side of Vea creates a myriad of mismatches for Todd Bowles and the defense. You're going to double team Vita Vea. All right, well, now you have Cansey one-on-one and Diaby coming screaming in off the edge. You want to double team Cansey? Now Vita Vea is one-on-one and clearing a path for a blitzing Antoine Winfield Jr. or Levante David or K.J. Britt. If they brought in a guy like Newton, you're going to double team him? All right, well, now you're dealing with Randy Gregory or Joe Tryon Shoyinka or you know a potential draft pick coming screaming off of that edge, getting a one-on-one opportunity. So Cansey had all the talent and athleticism in the world coming out of the draft last year. And while he was hampered with that injury that set him back a little bit, you saw throughout the year exactly why the Buccaneers ended up drafting him. And honestly, my favorite thing about what Cansey said to the media is that it's a clear example of his drive and maturity. He knows that he wasn't perfect. He knows he left plays out on the field, that he wasn't an all-pro or a Pro Bowl caliber player last year, but he wants to be, and that's what he is striving for. I know when I was talking about Randy Gregory after that signing and that Randy Gregory, when he spoke to the media, was saying all of the right things, and, and it's fine to see players talking the talk, but that he had to put those words into action and actually walk the walk. That's what we need to see out of Cansey now. He can grow and he can become a leader on this defense, potentially captain material in a, within the next couple of years, but there needs to be a visible improvement over his already solid rookie season. So a lot to be excited about regarding Kalijah Cansey. I'm going to jump into the chat Real quick, we got Matt in the chat saying best bucks podcast out. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate that. There's lots of great options. I am I'm honored that all of you join me on a day-to-day basis. And Matt also goes on to say, fingers crossed for an edge rusher in the first round. We'll see how things fall. There's plenty of, of players that they can address in the first round, whether it be edge, defensive line, offensive line. You could go corner. I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up in a little bit. You could even go wide receiver. Really, the the draft is Jason Light's oyster. And uh, really excited to see what they do. The waiting's almost over. We are single-digit days away from the NFL draft. So the speculation will end. The guessing games will end. The situational mock drafts will end. And we will have pure reaction as to what the Bucks did do rather than what I think they should do or what I think they could do or what I would do in their situation, we will have firm answers as to the newest members of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Divis Druid uh, in the chat uh, says, I am seeing rumblings that Golston is back because folks in the building don't like how Hall is developed. I will talk more about William Golston coming up in a little bit. I don't think that Logan Hall's development has much to do with it. I will talk about why he is back in the building. And uh, one more before we hit the break. Flash Gordon says, I thought he was playing well from the start, but I did see him make a jump at the end in the playoffs. He certainly had a impact in the beginning of the week one game against the Minnesota Vikings before he re-aggravated that injury. If I remember correctly, it was a calf injury. Um, so then he had to take a couple of weeks off, ended up coming back after the bye week, but you really saw his progression escalate towards the latter half of the year. So uh, big things ahead for Kalijah Cansey, but someone that did show massive improvement from their rookie year to their sophomore year was Zion McCollum, but now his expectations for himself just got even higher. That is coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It can be easy to ignore our social battery and spread ourselves thin, especially with social gatherings picking up after the winter. I know for me, between my day job, the podcast, and traveling every weekend due to my son's schedule, 
I find myself drained faster and faster every day, but still having to push through in all situations, telling myself it's for the greater good, regardless of how I feel in the moment, often ignoring my own needs in service of others. Speaking to someone on the outside without a personal bias in my day-to-day -day life can be extremely beneficial and help me reshuffle what I view as a priority versus what should actually be a priority. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a license, licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your social sweet spot with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. Thank you again for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. Every day, just make sure you are coming back tomorrow. I will be joined by Evan Klosky of 10 Tampa Bay. We are back for WTSP Wednesday, and he is going to drop a mock draft of his own. We are going to dive into that coming up on tomorrow's episode. But it's Locked On's NFL Mock Draft live on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern Time streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern time uh, to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from the local college football experts and even a fantasy football angle. The Locked On Mock Draft on April 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, streaming live on Locked On Sports Today's 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Going to jump into the chat real quick one more time. Uh, I got Flash Gordon in the chat saying, I've warmed up to Pork Chop Robinson. And yes, that is where he got his nickname Chop uh, in Chop Robinson. Uh, and then Divis Druid says, here's a question, James. Do you think Cansey would be viable off the edge while the Bucks go for someone inside like uh, Fisk? Uh, I don't. I don't think that Cansey has the speed that you need for a guy coming off the edge in a 3-4 defense. He is much better suited with his hand in the dirt on the defensive line next to Vita Vea, that is where he is going to have his biggest impact. I do like the idea of trying to shift some things around, and there will be opportunities where you will see Cansey standing up you know, on the, on the line, but he is not what the Bucs need in an edge rusher. Going to uh, keep chatting about this offseason workout program and some of the players that talk to the media, and Zion McCollum was one of those guys we've already discussed Todd Bowles' idea of who McCollum is in this defense. He is one of Todd Bowles' quote-unquote chess pieces, but I have also been extremely vocal about how impressed I was with McCollum last season. He stepped in for Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis numerous times throughout the year and played really well. I'm not going to say he was amazing or he was great or he was, you know, upper tier, anything like that, or you know, even that the Bucks need to give him like a mega extension as soon as possible. But he was leaps and bounds better last season than he was in his rookie year in 2022. Now, with a starting job within grasp, McCollum wants to take another big leap in his development and performance by focusing on what he can do better. He was asked where he wants to get better, and he told reporters, quote, becoming a playmaker. I mean, for me in college, I was always known for getting my hands on footballs and making plays, whether it was forced fumbles or interceptions. So that's the next point in my game to start making those big plays End quote beyond that. McCollum was also asked about his mindset saying, quote, everything I use as motivation, no matter what it is, positive or negative, And this is really no different. Every single year I'm going into every single off season, working as hard as I can. 
now having been thrown in the fire as much as I was last year and kind of knowing what to expect and know what I have to do to play at a super, super great form. It's just exciting for me. Every day I carry a chip on my shoulder and what I have to go get, end quote. Now, I've been saying for a few weeks that I believe that McCollum earned this starting job replacing Carlton Davis, who was traded away to the Lions. And he earned that with his play last year in the drafting a corner in the first round isn't my ideal move because it's so hard for a corner to become acclimated to bowl scheme and the responsibilities of corners in that scheme that he may not make an impact until mid to late season. And I did see a couple of people in the YouTube comments saying that it was because the Bucks had a bunch of second and third round corners and guys like Kool-Aid McKinstry or Nate Wiggins or Cooper DeGene won't take as long to develop. I am going to respectfully disagree. And that's fine. Everybody has their opinions. I've said that numerous times. You all have your opinions about the Bucs. I have my opinions about the Bucs. And I'm going to lay out why I disagree. When Bowles came in, the Bucs had Davis entering year two. Jamel Dean was a rookie. It wasn't until the Seattle game in week nine before Jamel Dean really got significant playing time. He had only three defensive snaps all season up to that point, and he was inactive for three weeks before that Week 9 matchup. And we all remember that Seattle game when Dean got lit like a Christmas tree. But by the end of the year, Dean was a full-time starter and developed into one of the better corners over the course of the next few years. Davis, in his first year under Bowles, you take a look, six passes defensed in the first seven weeks, 13 passes defensed in the final seven weeks. So you can even go back to Todd Bowles' Jets days. His first year as the Jets head coach, his starting corners were Darrell Rivas and Antonio Cromartie, two of the best to do it in recent memory. Darrell Rivas has a gold jacket. He is a Hall of Famer. Both got off to slow starts that year before Revis wound up a pro bowler and Cromartie came on strong late in the season. It doesn't matter what round these guys are drafted in. What matters is that they can understand their responsibilities and execute them. McCollum showed that he absolutely can do that. It just took a little bit of time. We had his coach, Casey Keller, on the show after Zion was drafted out of Sam Houston State, and he told us, that Zion's M.O. was that he was going to take a little bit of time to get his legs under him and understand his responsibilities and his job. But once he does, he will excel. And that's exactly what happened. Cornerback is the hardest position to transition from college to the NFL outside of quarterback. And with a defense as intricate and complex as Todd Bowles is, it makes it that much harder. I love what I'm hearing out of Zion McCollum, and I think we're going to see another big step in his progression this year because he's already proven that he can make those big steps year after year. It's only happened once, but he has a 100% success rate so far in his young NFL career of taking those big steps and making more improvements in his game. It was the running joke last season for those of you that have been with us since last year that David's bold prediction for every game was a Zion McCollum interception. Now, I think that McCollum himself is motivated enough to hyper-focus on working on that aspect of his game and create takeaways instead of just pass breakups, create fumbles instead of just tackles, which is another part of his game that really improved from his rookie year to his sophomore year, and he talked about that to the media. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but he basically said in college, he would just run full speed, lower his head, lower his shoulder, and plow into guys, and it would work. In the NFL, he realized after a couple of weeks that that's not going to work at this level, so he really focused on his form and his ability to tackle, and you saw that improvement from year one to year two. So I love what I saw out of McCollum last year. I would love to see that next big step, but I still believe that McCollum should be the starting corner heading into week one of the NFL season. Going to jump into the chat real quick before we hit our final break. Uh, we got Larry Fisherman saying, what's up, buddy? And uh, 
He said, we used to work together in Ohio. We were the only Bucks fans for a mile. Hope you're doing well. Larry, I appreciate you, buddy. Good to hear from you. Uh, David Stack says, calling it now, Zion will have five picks this year. I love that. That is a David Harrison level of uh, prediction there. And uh, we got Z-Mac out of from Scotty J. We got Z-Mac will be your number one corner. He's better than Dean. We'll see. I'm not, I'm not going to crown that yet because we've seen a very, very high level play out of Jamel Dean in the past. We know that he's capable of it. We just know that he didn't live up to that last year. Let's see if he goes back to form in 2024. And if not, you're looking at Zion McCollum and somebody else being your starting corners in 2025. But the Buccaneers have brought back a familiar face. That is next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With Game Time's last minute deals, you can save up to 60% off when buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, or theater near you. I love the all in pricing, so there's no shock when I get to check out what I see is what I pay. Then, when I get to check out, nothing makes it easier than being able to use Apple Pay. It takes me absolutely no time at all from the moment I pick my seats to the moment I have them right there on my phone. And with their lowest price guarantee, if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time is going to credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL. For $20 off your first purchase, terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Wrapping things up here on a Tuesday edition of the Locked On Bucks podcast. And the Buccaneers made two signings on Monday, starting with offensive lineman Lorenz Metz. But they also brought back defensive lineman William Golston for a 12th season with the Buccaneers. And Golston has been a constant for the Bucs over the years and is one of their more reliable defenders against the run. He's also the second longest tenured Buccaneer after being drafted in 2013. And it was something that I mentioned that I thought would happen a few weeks back, that if William Golston wanted to play another season, it would be in Tampa. And sure enough, he does return. And yes, he is a rotational and a situational player, but he's also a leader on that team. He is a knowledgeable veteran that is always willing and able to help the younger guys on the team and get them up to speed and and get them ready for the adjustments to NFL life. He's a great guy that other players love having in the locker room. Uh, Divis Drew had mentioned it in the chat uh, that you know, they had seen that there were rumblings that the Bucs didn't like the development of Logan Hall, and that's why Golston came back. Logan Hall is still your starter as it stands right now. William Golston is still a rotational guy, but that veteran mentor role, that veteran leadership that William Golston brings is a big reason that he is back, on top of the fact that he is productive when he is on the field. Again, his skill set lends more to the run defense than it does getting after the quarterback. I think he has 14 and a half career sacks over those 11 years that he has played so far. But William Golston returning obviously helps the defensive line depth, helps the rotation. And no, this move isn't going to move the needle for a lot of people outside of the Buccaneer spectrum. But Bucks fans are and should be very happy about this move. But I do want to talk about Lorenz Metz, really quick. He qualifies, for those that don't know, 
Metz qualifies as an international player through the NFL's International Pathway Program. And that means that the Bucs can now extend their practice squad to 17 players with Mets as, as the designated player on their exempt slash international player list. So Mets comes from Germany. He spent the 2023 offseason with the Chicago Bears, but he played collegiately at the University of Cincinnati and what he played both tackle and guard. So again, this goes back. I've talked about this a lot leading up to the draft. Jason Light loves those versatile offensive linemen that can play multiple positions because it allows them to carry fewer of those players because it provides depth at multiple positions. Um, Metz was also named to the all ACC first team in his junior year. When the UC Bearcats went to the college football playoff, he was blocking for Desmond Ritter. Sauce Gardner was on that team. That UC Bearcats team really was something that was exciting and fun to watch week to week. And, and people around here just absolutely ate it up and, and they were loving everything about the Bearcats. So he has some skill. He has some talent. Is this a guy that they could potentially place on their 53-man roster? We'll see. You know, he could get elevated from that practice squad, but for right now, it allows the Buccaneers to essentially carry a free, you know, quote unquote player on their practice squad because Mets does not actually count against the initial 90 man roster. So fun, fun little uh, thing to keep your eye on there. And of course, the Buccaneers playing with with some legal rules here where they basically get to carry an extra player. There's going to be plenty of competition around the offensive line based on what they do in the draft. Is Robert Hainsey going to stay at center? Are they going to draft a guard? Are they going to draft a center and move Hainsey? But there's going to be competition there. And there's going to be competition at a couple of positions. And then it's going to be a matter of which of these guys that can play multiple positions are going to work their way onto the roster as depth because we know it is so so important to have really solid depth in the trenches, both on the offensive line and defensive line. But if you can get away with carrying one fewer offensive lineman and maybe carry a sixth wide receiver or a, a fifth or sixth corner, you know, something like that, the Bucs are going to try to do it because you want those guys that can jump in and it doesn't matter if it's a tackle or a guard or a center that goes down. You have guys on the team they can play two or three positions along the offensive line. It, it's been something that Jason Light has been doing for years, and it really makes a lot of sense. Going to jump into the chat uh, one more time before we get out of here. Al Bundy, I haven't seen you in the chat in a little while. Uh, he says Mets equals practice squad. Yes, absolutely. Could wind up you know, on the active roster based on you know different things that happen throughout the year. But for right now, yeah, he is a, a practice squad player, but he's got some skill. He's got skill. He's got versatility. Um, we got Scotty J saying this team is building for a deep 2025 run. We need to draft looking that one year out, set it up this year. I mean, that's the ultimate goal for GMs and coaches across the league. Every draft, they're not just drafting for this year. They're drafting for the future. You go back to last year's draft in, in the selection of Jose Ramirez. He didn't have an impact last year. He was dealing with some injury, but now he is going to be in that edge rush rotation. And the Bucs are really excited to get him out on the field. But you're always drafting for not just that, you know, the upcoming season, but you're drafting for the future. So they, they are looking at setting that up. And that's why last week I went into that deep dive talking about Chris Godwin and the Buccaneers potentially using one of those four top 100 picks that they have on a wide receiver that can become a wide receiver too if Chris Godwin moves on. You don't want to have to force yourself into that situation in the draft next year. You draft a guy that can be wide receiver three this year, can become wide receiver two next year if they're not able to bring back Chris Godwin. And if they do bring back Chris Godwin, even better. Now you still have a viable three-headed monster at the wide receiver position with you know Mike Evans, and then you have basically two wide receiver twos right there ready to rock and roll. 
So that's always, always what teams are focused on, especially Jason Light. You are looking at the future while looking at the present and what they need. Um, Nirav or Nirav, unpopular opinion. I don't think we should take a wide receiver this year. A lot of free agents next year to, you know, he says for Godwin, but to potentially replace Godwin, maybe. But you got to take a look at some of those wider free agent wide receivers that uh, I had mentioned are going to hit the market. Some of those guys are already getting locked up now. Devonta Smith already got locked up. CD Lamb is going to get a deal. Justin Jefferson might hit the market, but the Bucks would not be in the market for him. We don't know how happy he's going to be in Minnesota after this year. Uh, Jamar Chase is not going to be leaving Cincinnati. They are going to set up to make sure that they keep him. T. Higgins will be the guy that hits the open market. But now you're talking about being in the same situation that you are right now, and, and you could be looking at, at paying two of your wide receivers 20 plus million dollars a year. That's not a recipe for success. You look to the draft, you know, especially this year. And I understand your point, but if you draft a wide receiver this year, now you're looking at four years of cost effective production that you can get out of a guy and you have a, a solid tandem like you see with Jamar Chase and, and T Higgins, or you see with uh, last year with Nico Collins and Tank Dell in Houston. Now they've added Stefan Diggs, but they have two other incredible receivers, you know, for a very, very cheap price. So free agency is fun and it, it makes headlines and it gets fans all excited and it sells jerseys. But if you're looking for long-term with Baker getting money, Mike Evans getting money, Antoine and Tristan are about to get money. You're going to want to draft a wide receiver so that that is not costing you a big chunk of your salary cap. Uh, Jimbo Shrump says 20 million, a receiver is the new normal. The cap continues to increase year by year. I'm going to disagree with you there because there's only one team in the NFL that has two wide receivers making 20 plus million dollars a year. And it's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So your wide receiver ones are going to make that kind of money. But if you're paying two of your receivers, that kind of money plus a potential quarterback contract, I, you're chewing up a lot of your salary cap. And yes, the salary cap is going to keep going up, but you still have to pay a lot of other playmakers at other positions. Um, last one real quick, Al Bundy, I would be so happy if we got a Donnie Mitchell at 26. I doubt it would happen. I doubt it would happen too, but honestly, I would be pretty excited about what he brings to the team. I would just be concerned about what they're going to do at edge rusher and offensive line, but as I have preached on this show, it's about the collective, not the individual pick. So we're not going to overreact to night one. We're going to see what happens on night two and into day three. But that is going to do it for this episode. Please make sure you are coming back tomorrow. I will be joined by Evan Klosky. He's going to bring you his own mock draft. I'm really excited to dive into that. Make sure you're checking out everything going on over at BucksNation.com. Follow on Twitter at LockedOnBucks, at JRCO underscore Bucks, and become a Locked On Bucks insider. Go to JoinSubtext.com slash LockedOnBucks. Hope you all have an absolutely outstanding day. Stay safe, stay healthy, fire the cannons. I want to thank you so much for joining me right here on Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 